good morning and a very warm welcome to our service of morning prayer on this the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And bless be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Come, let us worship God our King. Come, let us worship Christ, our King and our God. Jesus said, before you offer your gift, go and be reconciled. As brothers and sisters in God's family, we come together to ask our Father for forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord is our light and our life. Oh, come, let us worship. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior. Born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies. From the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers. And to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation, by the forgiveness of their sins, in the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. The Lord is our light and our life. O come, let us worship. A reading from the book of Genesis. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. The band said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zelpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country. Giving the younger before the firstborn, complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also, in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. And then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 105, verses 1 to 11, and verse 45. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. And speak of all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength. Continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done his wonders, and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham, 
his servants. Our children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments prevail in all the world. He has always been mindful of his covenant. The promise he made for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham. The oath that he swore to Isaac. Which he established as a statute for Jacob. An everlasting covenant for Israel. Saying, to you will I give the land of Canaan. To be your allotted inheritance. Hallelujah. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. <laughs> Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore and they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes. They replied.
He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Our Bishop Todd is offering a Sunday sermon series on Genesis based on our our Old Testament readings. We have a unique opportunity as a parish and as a diocese to benefit from Bishop Todd's gifts as a preacher and teacher and to get to know our bishop better as well. We hope you enjoy the series. The Lord be with you. I'm Todd Townsend, Bishop of Huron. The first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are so loaded with meaningful images that it's taking forever, you might say, just to go through what is called the prehistory, these stories that imply so much meaning for life in every age. This week we're going to look at three separate stories that occur east of Eden, completing this section of the book of Genesis. Cain and Abel in chapter 4, Noah and the Flood, chapter 6 to 9, and the Tower of Babel, chapter 11. Next week, we'll be taking a trip to Camp Huron on the shores of Lake Huron, our diocesan summer camp. It's, it's an unusual summer there, but it's one of the great places that our children and youth learn about God, creation, Jesus, and the human life in relation to God. So the video will happen there next week. And then the following week, as a preview to the next major section of Genesis, we'll look at three very important women in these stories, Eve, Sarah, and Hagar and pay attention to what their perspective means in this, which is quite important. So, okay, on to these stories. As we saw in chapter 3, things go wrong very quickly for the humans, and now we pick up the story again in chapter 4, and it's clear that things are are still not right. Uh, The humans, Adam and Eve, have given in to the temptation to arrange the world according to what suits them. Uh, They wanted to run their own show without any need for God, And there they are now, east of Eden, not in God's garden anymore. God's still with them. God is beginning the great reconciliation project. But things are not right out there. In Genesis chapter 4, we see that Adam and Eve have children. And children usually provide all the drama a narrative needs, and it's no different here. The drama of Cain and Abel shows us that it is tough enough to try to live in God's world according to God's terms, as Adam and Eve found out. But a second dilemma is learning how to live with God's other creatures, specifically other human creatures. How can we live in peace with our human siblings? First child born is Cain, then comes Abel. Cain's name means to get, to create. As firstborn, he embodies future possibility. Abel's name means vapor, or nothingness, which is a rather dismissive start. Can you imagine introducing these kids to your friends? Have you met my boys? Everything and nothing. So from the start, Abel is uh, dismissed and Cain is the embodiment of vitality. Abel was a keeper of sheep, Cain a tiller of the ground. The siblings wanted to worship God and make an offering. Both bring their best offering. Both had reason to expect that God would accept their best. There was no hint of rivalry or hostility between them. The trouble doesn't actually begin with Cain, but with Yahweh. And here Yahweh, God of Israel, accepts one gift and rejects the other. And there's no explanation given for this. Just in some kind of capricious freedom of God, God unfairly accepts Abel's offering and rejects Cain's. And this creates a crisis. It evokes the shadow side of the human relationship. And Cain's face falls when his gift is rejected and he becomes angry. Why are you angry, Cain? Asks Yahweh. And at this point, Yahweh is the least likable character in the story. Cain asks Yahweh, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. This is the first mention of sin in the Bible. And Yahweh seems to be creating tension in the humans to reveal the challenge of being human, 
east of Eden. Cain does not master his desire to do violence. He invites his brother Abel out into the field and he kills him. And again, here is this term desire. Sin was waiting like a hungry lion to ready to leap. Yahweh told Cain that he must master this desire, but he doesn't. And now Abel is dead and Cain is a murderer. When asked, where is your brother? Cain takes no responsibility for his brother. And that angered Yahweh. Cain is investigated, sentenced to banishment, sent away from the presence of the Lord. And he's escorted out further east of Eden, I guess. But the Lord has mercy on him, puts a mark of protection on Cain so that nobody would kill him. So there's happy story number one. Humans have trouble dealing well with one another. Humans will have to learn to resist sin. Violence against your brother will not be tolerated. Of course, the story is much more complicated and ambiguous than that, so if, if you have the inclination, I suggest reading John Steinbeck's book, uh, East of Eden. It's the, for the best literary exposition known for this part of Genesis. That's not the last brother story we're going to encounter in Genesis, so we'll, we'll keep it in mind as we go. The next story we come to casts our gaze on Noah in chapter 6 through 9. Uh, Adam and Eve have been given another son after they lost their first two, and his name was Seth. And somehow from Seth, without too much concern about reproductive details, by the time we get to Noah, uh, the people had multiplied and multiplied, and the wickedness had multiplied and multiplied, to the point where the Lord wanted to blot out from the earth the human beings I have created. The Lord says, I'm sorry. The Lord's regretful that he's made them. The earth has become corrupt. It was filled with violence. But Noah had found favor in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord says to Noah, I'm going to end this and start over. Go make yourself an ark of cypress. And then the instructions come about how to build it and how to fill it with two of every kind just two. And the Lord made a covenant with Noah. And then the rains begin to fall. So here we are, in my Bible, just seven pages into a 2,000 page book. And we've gone from a wonderful creation, a perfect garden home for the Creator to live in right relationship with the creatures. And the humans have been given a central place in this garden with everything they need. We've gone from that to a series of events that sees, sees them being kicked out of the garden into a life where their children murder one another and where a few generations later violence and corruption have grown to cover the earth uh, to the point that the Creator wants to wipe out the whole thing with a flood. Within all this, God doesn't abandon them. The Lord is angry, but still acts with some mercy to protect, to protect the creation. God keeps promising a future. And now, even in exasperation, God makes a covenant with the one faithful human that can be found. Then, finally, we come to the, the story of the Tower of Babel. It goes like this. At one time, the whole earth spoke the same language. It so happened that as they moved out of the east, they came upon a plain and settled down. They said to one another, come, let's make bricks and fire them well. And they used brick for stone and tar for mortar, and they said, let's build ourselves a city and a tower that reaches heaven. Let's make ourselves famous and godlike, and so we won't be scattered all over the earth. And God came to look over the city and the tower these people had built, and God took one look and said, one people, one language. Well, this is just a first step, no telling what they'll come up with next. They'll stop at nothing, so we'll go down and garble their speech so they won't understand each other. Then God scattered them from there all over the world and they had to quit building the city. That's how it came to be called Babel or Babel or Babel because their language had turned into Babel. Uh, and from there God would scatter them which they didn't want. There are endless meaning to these stories. Uh, one thing is clear. God the Creator will protect and preserve the divine human boundary. God is totally and completely other, infinitely different in quality from the human creatures. 
we are made in God's image, we can know and love God, but God will not let us take control of the divine reign. It just cannot be. And we have a hard time learning this, and we end up desiring violence and disharmony instead of right relationship with God. So we pray, even now, for the continuing intervention of the Holy One. We pray that God will continue to be in Christ by the power of the Spirit to reconcile all things to God's own self. And we pray this urgently. Amen. Those of you who are still here at the end of the video will be pleased to know that last week Stephanie Donaldson was the first to name St. George's Godrich as the church that appeared at the end of the video. And what follows after this is a second St. George's church in the Diocese of Huron. Let's see who can guess it this week. Here's a hint. This is the church where I grew up from grade 1 to grade 11. This was my neighborhood. Have a great week. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. The response to the prayers today is, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Treasuring your promise to hear us when we call, we pray for the Church, those in need, and all of your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our hear prayer. Hear our prayer. In the Anglican Communion, we pray for the Diocese of Miseno, North Kenya, Utah, and Honduras. We also pray for Justin of Canterbury. In the Anglican Church of Canada, we pray for Bishop Jane Alexander, the clergy and people of the Diocese of Edmonton. We pray also for Mark, our in National Indigenous Archbishop, and Linda, our Primate. In the Diocese of Huron, we pray for Todd, our Bishop, and Marinez, Bishop of Amazonia. We pray also for the clergy and people of St. Augustine, St. David, St. Mark, St. James, St. John's in Windsor. In our deanery, we pray for the Venerable Dr. Timothy Dobbin, the Reverend John Ogilvie, and for all the clergy and people of St. Mark's Brantford. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. For the Church throughout the world and its leaders, that the work of the Spirit unite us in Christ to proclaim the wonders of God, let us pray. Guide leaders of nations so that they will be people after our own hearts, and guide their feet into the way of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. We thank you for this congregation. Give us gratitude for the many blessings we always enjoy and inspire us to give thanks. Empower us daily to serve Christ in sincerity and faithfulness. We pray for those involved in our weekly online worship service, for our wardens and staff, our up-and-coming online Vacation Bible School team. Help us to deepen our faith and understanding during this time of separation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pour out favor this day upon those who are afflicted and feel far removed from you. Send them companions who will show them you are ever near. We pray especially for Evelyn, Dorothy, Ella, Malcolm, John, Barb, Nathan and family, Sue, Elaine, Nancy, Marg, Dave, Helen, Carol, 
Owen and family, Duane, Aldo, Marky, Peter, Craig, and Jim. And we also pray for those whose names appear on our long-term prayer list. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our ancestors who have inspired us by their lives of faith, that thankful for their witness, we could confidently proclaim our salvation. We give thanks for the life and witness of Jean McIsaac, and we pray for Kevin, Corey, and Calla during their time of grief. We give thanks for the life and witness of Alan Reese, and we pray for Ellie, David, and their extended family in their grief. We give thanks for the life and witness of Hans Van Roost, and pray for Mikey Schroeder and her extended family in their grief. We pray for all those who are celebrating another year. May your special day be filled with God's love and miracles he has especially for you. Merciful God, you hear the prayers of your people even before they are spoken. We commend these and all our prayers to you, trusting in your abundant mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. God of eternal wisdom, you alone impart the gift of discernment. Grant us understanding hearts, so that we may choose wisely between the treasures of your promised reign and the world's counterfeits. Through Jesus Christ, the pearl of true value. Amen. A colleague for racial reconciliation. O God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us sing as our Saviour taught us. Bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May Christ, who out of defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill you with his new life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
in peace, sir. Love and serve the Lord.